So no many cases of months. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Here in Europe, everything, well, exception of England, everything is getting a little bit more normal, except England. Uh, okay, England we'll talk England. later. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Let me try this out. Okay. Yes, be honest. Um, hi, Felix. Hi, hi. Hi. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thanks, Hugo. Okay, it's time. Let's start. Good morning to my friends in uh, UK, Europe, Germany, Austria. Uh, good afternoon to those friends of mine in Euro Asia, uh, South Africa, Egypt. And, and a good evening to those of us in Asia, all the way down to uh, Indonesia. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to be your host uh, for this series of webinars. Um, my international group of friends uh, and colleagues would like to share our experience in Haifu with you. Uh, then what is Haifu? Haifu is high intensity focused ultrasound, a procedure that would change the practice of gynecology and would add a new dimension to treatment of uterine fibroids and adenomyosis. We are talking about a knife, a virtual knife. In fact, the knife is invisible and you can't hear the sound because the sound will be emitted just above this triangular bowl of water and will probably hit somewhere here. So this is the virtual knife called, known as Hai Fu. This is brought to you by my two organizing uh, societies, APH and ISMIS. APH is, stands for Asia Pacific Association of Gynecologic Endoscopy, founded in 2003 in Taipei. I will try to uh, identify uh, all these friends of mine. This is Professor Li Qilong, the chairman of APH. This is a friend, I think his name is Bruce. This needs no introduction. Professor Harry Rich, the man who did the first laparoscopic hysterectomy. Uh, my friends behind from Japan, Ho Shiai, from Korea, Nam, myself, Professor uh, Yuan Pang Mo, and this young fella uh, is hey. this, believe it or not, is our speaker and the president elect of APH, and you'll see him very soon. And hey. one more, and that is. Uh, one of the fastest hands and fastest fingers with the electric guitar is uh, Professor Masaki Endow standing behind. This is a recent picture with, uh, uh, of us taken in Chongqing in 2019, July. You can see most of the hair has turned brown or white. That is Dr. Zheng from, Jay Cheng from uh, Taipei, Hugo, our friend from Germany, Europe, doing uh, yoga is uh, Professor Selva from Malaysia, Malacca, myself. On uh, this one is well-known figure in China, Hong Kong, uh, Professor Felix Wong, and of course, the chairman of uh, APH and whom everybody knows, uh, Professor Li Qilong. This is ISMIS. And ISMIS, founded on the philosophy of diseases that harm require therapies that harm less. That is their ideology. And they have uh, annual uh, biannual meetings. They call it Yangtze Summit held in Chongqing every two years. Founded in 2013, uh, this is a picture of the crowd. When you have anything that is held in Chongqing is in, or in China is in the thousands. This is 2015, and this is a 2017, where I first met uh, friends from Ismis. Uh, the old name is Ismanim. Uh, right behind is this, uh, Anthony from Spain. That is uh, Professor Felix Wong, 
our friend Virat from uh, Thailand, some chai from Thailand. And this is the recent page uh, photograph again. This is the board member led by, at present, Professor Dave Crankston, I think this is Gail, and all the other members. Uh, this is Professor from South Africa, Professor from Egypt, and this is a uh, very active uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Rosie Zing. There's a Choi that will be the speaker in later, and all my friends. And right here, my teacher, uh, Zhang Lian, and this is uh, Professor Wang Ziqiao. Okay, hey, one of the things that captivates me is when Professor David Crankston uh, spoke about Haifu last year, and a very interesting statement he made was, Haifu therapy can activate anti-tumor, sorry, anti-tumor immune responses. I think it is really something which I never expected, something from sound can be anti-tumor. Um, the next picture will be, then we have the closed door meeting uh, in Chongqing. On the left hand side, all the members from Ismis and on the right hand side from a page. And after the closed door meeting, the following day, we have signed a memorandum of understanding that covers Haifu training, education, research, and certification. On stage are the members from APH and ISMIS, and behind is the chief of ONG in the whole of China, Professor Liang Jinghe. Uh, he represents the China ONG uh, Association, and in under him, an association with 160,000 members. That's Professor Liang Jinghe witnessing the signing of the MOU. Now, it is my personal journey and also a journey for many of the gynecologists and I think future gynecologists, uh, whom I term is an evolution from laparotomy, open surgery to laparoscopy, and now to really, really scarless surgery. In other words, you really do not have a scar on the skin. Even the mono laparoscopy and uh, and however small the incisions are with your laparoscopy, there will be a scar. But this is truly scarless. The highlight of this is I want to uh, show everybody is, oops, that there are actually two different versions of therapeutic haifu for benign uterine tumors. First, we have the MRI guided, which actually uh, give you a thermal power versus what we are talking for the next four uh, webinars is ultrasound guided haifu. And ultrasound guided haifu has ablative power in contrast to thermal power. There lies the difference. And I have a little summary here, but I think the, the speakers will delve more in detail and that is, if you compare MRI guided HIFU and ultrasound guided HIFU, the treatment efficiency called MPV is 20 to 50%. And it is about 80 and 90% if you use a ultrasound guided HIFU. In other words, the ability power, the efficiency is much stronger. And if you want to ablate or treat any fibroids or adenoiosis, you need something that's more than 70 to 75% of uh, treatment efficiency or NPV. Now, what's very interesting that made me walk back uh, to listen to somebody who wants to talk to me about HIFU is, in MRI guided HIFU, it is the interventional radiologist that is doing the work, but in ultrasound guided HIFU, it is a gynecologist or any trained doctor. So uh, I am, so because of the ability power of the ultrasound guided HIFU, it is a procedure that can be done by gynecologists, 
surgeon or radiologist or any trained doctor. And the duration of ultrasound Haifu procedure is independent of the MRI machine. So the MRI machine or facility can be put to better use. In other words, we do not need to trouble our radiologist colleagues so much because they, they are busy people. Okay, there are four webinars organized by uh, the two societies uh, on uterine fibro and Numa. And there are 20 experts that will be joining us uh, from all over Asia, Europe, and the world. And plus, uh, one, I would say, mystery guest that will join us. And the dates, uh, today on June, the next one will be on Tuesday, the 23rd of June, followed by two weeks later on the 9th of July on the Thursday, yes, the last yeah. one on the Thursday on the uh, can I can I request that somebody mute the uh, the audience or, or the registrant who just joined us? Thank you very much. Okay, today we have uh, my co-chairperson is Professor Chang Lian, a very interesting I think you've muted yourself as well. Can you hear me? Am I back in Audible again? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks, David. Okay. Um, professor Zhang Lian, my co-chair, is the Secretary General of Isthmus. He's the professor of Chongqing Medical University. He is the man or the chief trainer that has under his arm 60 other trainers all over Asia, Europe to train uh, practitioners who wants to learn Haifu. And every trainer must have at least done 1,000 Haifus in order to qualify as a trainer. That is uh, Professor Zhang Lian, my teacher. There he is teaching me and then he was giving a talk to us in, uh, in Singapore. Then the next is uh, panelist, Dr. Manjula. She is the head of department chief OBGYN and laparoscopic surgeon. And she works out from Max Cure Suyasha Hospital, which is awarded the best emerging hospital in ONG by the Times Healthcare Achievers 2018. Dr. Manjula is the winner of many academic and clinical achievement awards. Notable, very notable is she is the Guinness World Record title holder for removing the most fibroids in a single operation. All in all, she removed in a single operation 84 fibroids and she is the record holder of uh, the number of fibroids removed and it is noted in the Guinness World Record. That is Dr. Manjula. Next, the opening remarks will be given by Professor Li Chi Long. He's the chairman of APH, founder of APH, pillar of strength of APH, a great teacher of laparoscopic surgery, especially in the very demanding field of laparoscopic cancer surgery. He teaches MIS to many countries in Asia, year in and year out tirelessly. He's very well respected in Asia and the world, and he's based in Changkeng Memorial Hospital in Taipei. The next that will be doing the opening remarks is Professor David Crankston. Professor David Crankston is the president of ISMIS, 
which is the International Society of Minimally Invasive and Virtual Surgery. He's a urological surgeon. His special interest is in renal surgery and, and in 1986 received an award for kidney transplantation based on his research. In 2001, he was the clinical director of high intensity focused ultrasound unit in Oxford. And together with a team from United Kingdom and Chongqing, China, they are researching into treatment of cancer without surgery. He was the first recipient of the Golden Cystoscope Award in 2001 and has performed more than 2,000 operations on the kidney. He played a major role in getting the recognition of HIFU for fibroid treatment into NICE guideline. And NICE stands for National Institute for Health and Care UK, uh, in the UK. Now, without further ado, let's invite Professor Li Qilong to make his opening remarks. Professor Li Qilong, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ky. Okay. Yeah. Where do I find him? Yes, you can make your remarks now, Qilong. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, I know it's difficult. Uh, it's my crazy oh, no. yeah. yeah, to welcome you all to 220 R page. It means high full the first last one minute. There are total four one minute holding, which will be focused on the high full fibroid, adenomyosis, and uh, infertility topics. And the project will figure R page and uh, majorly. Asia's doctors on their view of the fibroid and the adenomyosis. Doctors from Europe and the West will also be invited as a panelist. They will be also be invited high food expert to talk about high food treatment and uh, their experiences. And you know, they have a big change recently. And uh, not only because of the COVID-19, is now it's getting better, that, but also they have some announcement from about the cervical cancer. They announced that maybe the open surgery will be uh, the standard in the treating about uh, the cervical cancers. So they ignore the some bias uh, in the leg study. So they announced the open surgery was better than a very big change also. But our society, RPH, have a launch, a mitral study uh, is the minimally invasive therapy versus open radical surgery uh, in cervical cancers. I hoped in uh, within my years, we can come out a very uh, promising uh, outcome by the minimal image surgery. And also, they have a third very big change is about the scarlet surgery, not only in China, in Singapore, but also in Taiwan. They have uh, so many, many doctors have a uh, so it's a big change in the world also. Uh, in early, not only in the COVID-19, but also the cervical cancer, but also the scarlet have a, a very important change already. And the uh, RPG also have a webinar in the in last month and the uh, uh, last thanks, Rishan, and also the Kiwai, and also the many surgeons from the Indians, Australia, Malaysia, United States, Philippines, China, Thailand, and uh, Myanmar, and uh, Indonesia. Thanks for they join us, and I hope they can join uh, join us in, in this uh, webinar. And the mission of the webinars is to foster the academic pursuit in the new field 
of the non-invasive surgery and promote endoscope techniques. Knowledge and the education exchange between the hospital and the regions and the country among the Asia Pacific regions. And the webinars will bring together experts from the Asia Pacific exchange skills and ideas, also to learn from each other besides to earn uh, recognition for their outstanding performance. It's, a, it's an exceptional opportunity to keep up to date on the latest developing in the gynecology, minimally invasive therapy, especially in high food. I hope you, the webinar will be an inspirational one, also reward of the academic conference will by our page and the and the and the, all the study and the, on the high uh, we were looking for participation. Thank you. Am I live? Yeah. Thank you, Chilong. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Very clear. Thank you, very yes. Thank you for that inspiring speech. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will invite uh, the president of ISMIS, Professor David Crankston, to deliver his opening remarks. Professor David Crankston, please. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, Wan Sang Hao, greetings from the United Kingdom. Wan Sang Hao. In these extraordinary times. Uh, we are slowly easing the lockdown, but I think we are behind most of you. And it is good to see it easing elsewhere. London was badly hit. Oxford, where I am speaking from now, was not so badly hit. But uh, we have a big surgical backlog, as many of you do. And uh, it is wonderful to be asked to uh, introduce this excellent program. Uh, obviously, there are great sadnesses and problems during these times, but also opportunities. And of course, many of you will know that the Chinese word for crisis means danger and opportunity. And uh, as we are looking at virtual webinars, we are talking about virtual surgery. And I personally think that this may be a great opportunity for HIFU because we will be looking at uh, patients who do not need invasive surgery. So it is a great pleasure to uh, give these opening remarks and uh, I hope for those of you who don't know Haifu, that you will learn about it. I see that it is a great opportunity for the future of surgery. As, uh, as has already been said, I'm primarily a, gynecologist, uh, a urologist, but I have been very involved with gynecology and it has been very good to see uh, it approved for gynecology for uh, fibroids through the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK. We are also looking at it in many other situations in pancreatic cancer, in liver cancer, in sarcomas, and in uh, potentially in breast cancer. But fibroid is the greatest opportunity at the moment, and it is the one that worldwide has had the greatest numbers. So uh, I hope you really enjoy and learn a lot from these webinars, but I see Haifu as the future of surgery in many areas. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, before I invite the next speaker, let me say... something about uh, uh, Professor Prashant uh, chirurgical surgery in India. The first Indian to perform laparotic hysterectomy in India and Asia. He was also the past president of International Society of Gynae Endoscopy, which is ISG. 
Ji Yi, and he's the past president of Indian Association Gynae Endoscopies, and he's also the founder, vice president, Asia Pacific Association Gynae Endoscopy APH. He has many, many accolades and done many, many uh, teaching all over the world. He invented of 14 instruments in laparoscopy, and he's now the director of a clinic whom he calls Magic Clinic for Women in And he works out of a hospital, which uh, events that happen in uh, my friend Prashant's life is uh, he was involved in that Mumbai terrorist terrorist attack in the hospital in the hotel in Mumbai, and he was face to face with the rifle of a terrorist. And if you ask him uh, how did he escape, his answer is very short: run run faster than the bullet. So over to the man who can run faster than the bullet and who's alive today to give us his lecture. Uh, good afternoon. The skill in laparoscopic myomectomy. Over to you, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, uh, Keen Wai Lee. And, uh, also to Chi Long, Lee, and all my friends in APAGE. It's wonderful to be back with the APAGE, though we couldn't meet in person, as we should have. I will uh, proceed now to my talk, and hopefully I should be able to share my screen. Uh, let me see how. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so uh, my talk is on uh, uh, the, uh, the skills at laparoscopic myomectomy, what are the tips and tricks? And to go back to a Cochrane study where, which is again, uh, I'm happy that one of my colleagues, Dr. Bhave was actually heading this study in 2014, where they showed finally that uh, when they looked at uh, uh, 23 potentially relevant trials, they, they were able to conclude that laparoscopic myomectomy is a procedure that is less subjectively reported with less subjectively reported post-operative pain, fever, and shorter hospital stays as compared to open myomectomy. And now it is a gold standard of therapy uh, over the traditional route of uh, myomectomy. The, um, like any laparoscopy, it's important that you understand the anatomy, the instruments, the technique, the difficulties that could be encountered, what are the possible complications that could arise and therefore you should avoid them and also identify. For example, if you have opened up the cavity, you should note that you opened the cavity and then also you need to make a note on the, on the operation notes that this cavity was open. So the patient has to be monitored well during her pregnancy and labor if she's allowed to go into labor. So one needs to understand what the, are the limits of this uh, procedure. Um, a myomectomy is more challenging than doing a hysterectomy because one needs to preserve the uterus, and uh, there are uh, symptoms that would then suggest that, that this lady requires a myomectomy. So it's technically more difficult than a hysterectomy. But there have been many concerns for a laparoscopic myomectomy in the earlier times because of the feasibility of the technique. People were worried about complication rates, about conversion rates to uh, um, uh, open surgery, and they were worried about the long-term outcome as a result of the myomectomy. So coming back to the, the section and our times in our med school, you need to revisit anatomy, uh, go back to the cadaver to understand what the actual anatomy is so that you can extrapolate it towards your surgical anatomy. Strategy and ergonomy are always very important. One needs to understand the position of the surgeon and the position of the ports. When you talk of the surgeon, I'm short in height. And therefore, I need to ensure that I can get my table as low down as I can. But the rule of the thumb is that the operating surgeon's umbilicus should be at or above the level of the patient's umbilicus. And that's the only way you can actually work more ergonomically at myomectomy than one would, uh, that, just as one would uh, during a laparotomy. 
Now, it's very important that one manipulates the uterus, for which you need to have a good manipulator because the key to good surgery is exposure. So you want optimal visualization, maximal access, and adequate and optimal exposure. And therefore, you, you can use any manipulator. We developed our own because it's the fifth hand in the pelvis. It allows you different kinds of movements in four axis, anti-word, retro-word, lateral displacement, cranial displacement, and rotation around the axis so that your object that you not need to dissect is right in your field of action and you can go ahead without any problems. So our primary port for small uteri has always been the, the umbilicus, the, uh, the cavity of the umbilicus. However, the uterus is at or above the umbilicus, you then have to employ the point that my friends Li and Wang from Changgung, uh, and uh, Li is sitting there, um, he described this point. Originally in 1991, he described the point that was midway between the ziki sternum and the umbilicus, but soon enough, you had an upper and a lower uh, Li Wang point, depending upon your, your size of the uterus, you would then use either the upper or the lower Li Wang points. Now, uh, I entered the abdomen after creating a pneumoperitoneum. I use a high pressure entry to enter into the abdomen and go up to about 20, 25, or even 30, depending upon how obese the woman may be, because I can create a good carbon dioxide astrodome for me to enter with my cannula. I do not use a trocar cannula. I use the endotip cannula. That is, you avoid a trocar so that the entry is safe. It is guaranteed because it's under vision and that you do not really have to worry about any injury to the bowel or the, uh, or the omentum or any of the structures. And therefore, as you would see that as you, you would be uh, creating the pattern, there is your visual entry inside the abdomen where you're rotating clockwise so that you get past all the layers of the abdomen. You're only inside the skin with your knife, nothing else. And the, and the, and the endotip cannula does the job for you. And there you just penetrate into the peritoneal cavity, uh, peritoneum, and you are now visualizing the peritoneal cavity, right? Our portals are three or four. We, I employ the coarse point, uh, which I, uh, which as you can see uh, out here, you've got number two and number three are the uh, lower portals. The coarse point is number one. I am being a left hand dominant at laparoscopy. I stand on the left side so that my left hand is more active than my right going through point number two and uh, 10 to 12 uh, centimeters uh, vertical is the line, uh, is the point described by Charles Poe from Milwaukee. And that's the, um, uh, the uh, point on the left side. You, if you want to use your right hand dominant, you can go onto the right side and uh, use a point out here so that your left uh, port uh, hand goes to this point out here. Now that again, depends upon how, what your choice is. So, uh, and the placements being understood uh, we need to understand what is triangulation. Now, my friends from France uh, do not like to go through this. They, they prefer to go through a different route, and that is uh, going <clears throat> sub-umbilical, that is four finger breadths below the uh, umbilical uh, portal, or if they are going through the Li Wang point, they would put this point through the umbilicus. So you've got two triangles out there, like an isosceles, so that you are more ergonomic. As you can see, the surgeon is more comfortable this way uh, now, the choice is yours whether you want to go by this uh, method, but it, it, it definitely you will not go by the older method, the contralateral. Look at this uh, uh, doctor. He's uh, standing very uncomfortable. He's raising his shoulders and his elbows, and soon he will have to see an orthopedic surgeon. On the other hand, if you're following the, uh, the, the, the recommendation of code to be epsilateral, you are more ergonomic because both hands are on the same side of your body. So therefore, he described the ipsilateral suturing technique of uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, sur uh, surgery, and uh, that was more ergonomic than the contralateral methods. So when we look at myomectomy, we look at four parts. One is to enucleate the fibroid. Second is to achieve good hemostasis, uh, adequate hemostasis. Third is the closure of the my myoma bed. And fourth is the delivery of the myoma. So we prepare the myoma by using vasopressin. Now, in, our, in India, avazopressin is readily available and it is officially allowed to be used as a product into the subcapsular region. So we dilute <clears throat> one ampule that is 20 units in 200 mils of normal saline or ringer lactate till, and you inject till the, uh, the uh, uterus is almost white. 
So then you proceed to enucleation and you make a transverse incision. Now along uh, the uh, lines of the monogram of uh, Charles Coe, we believe that the incision should be transverse and not vertical as was described by Sir Victor Bonney in the early 1900s. So therefore, uh, the, why we do we use this incision? Because this incision is less vascular. So you go on uh, making your incision till the, the fibra literally pops out. And uh, of course, it's being held by uh, the blood supply at the base, which is what you have to take care of. So basically, as you go, uh, go, go on uh, uh, making your incision, the incision should be wide enough, that is across the diameter of the fibroid. So if it's a four centimeter fibroid, maybe about five, five or six centimeter incision across the serosa would be enough so that there's no pulling and tugging. The fibroid literally pops out under, under pressure, of course, aided with the vector of the forces of the grasping forceps of the tenaculum that is being used. Now, uh, so we employ a tenaculum. You can use a minor screw that was uh, developed by Kurt Sam earlier, but you can see that if I want to move my fibroid around and disengage my tenaculum, it's easier. If I have to go on screwing and unscrewing, it takes a lot of time. So you want to be a little quick in your uh, maneuvers, and therefore, I prefer using the tenaculum. Uh, the uh, vector of the forces with the uh, tenaculum acting on one side and on the opposite side, the uterine manipulator, helps you to identify the, the tissues. You do not go on coagulating every time. You only can cut straight away, or you can uh, coagulate only the bleeding area, the, the blood borne tissue. So you don't want any bleeding to occur. Of course, we are working on live tissues, so there will be some fair degree of oozing. If you try and be very patient, you can actually find the planes of cleavage very well and you can coagulate and cut. So once you have delivered the, the fibroid, then of course is the, uh, the, uh, is the suturing that needs to be done because the fibroid is parked away and then you suture. So that's again to show you in the lab how the close point is. And look, I'm more ergonomic this way than if I were to be contralateral. Now, what is the vertical zone that he talks about? He refers to the sagittal plane that the curved needle moves through during a, su a suturing, which is the ideal way one does at a laparotomy. So you're easily replicating the procedure at laparoscopy. It's a technique that resembles relaxed suturing modes at laparotomy, and therefore they're less fatigued from repetitive suturing. It allows you effective and accurate needle driving and suture placement without any limitations that could be imposed by closed uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery. Now, what is the rationale? The rationale is that most organs require a transverse closure. Prolonged suturing requires the arms to be relaxed with both hands on the same side as, my, as the body. That means an ipsilateral approach. It, in, in relation to open suturing, it allows intuitive moves. The needle moves down vertically every time you rotate the needle holder. So with the result, you're eliminating the fulcrum effect that could occur. And therefore, these objectives are met with this algorithm of suturing in the vertical zone. Now, as Hurst showed, that the horizontal incision seems easier to close because the blood vessels are going transversely and therefore they cause less damage to the muscle fibers and less bleeding. Now, when you look at the theory of, uh, of suturing, you look at two, par uh, two variables and uh, let's focus on these two. One is that the needle holder must be parallel to the line of your incision and two is that the needle must be at right angles to the needle holder. So that's the needle inclination on the needle holder and the needle rotation on the needle holder. So then we come to the, um, uh, the, the uh, technique, the incision being horizontal, the closure is also horizontal. Therefore you use your right hand and your left hand. So you, at laparoscopy, you need to be ambidextrous. You need to have two needle holders and not just one needle holder because you have a right-sided needle holder and a left-sided needle holder. The needle holders are curved at the end because uh, it allows you good movement uh, and passage and especially when you're, uh, when you're knotting, it resembles like a pair of chopsticks that are curved, right? So therefore, I would um, uh, prefer that uh, I use curved needle holders rather than straight needle holders. I like my uh, handles of my needle holders to be at right angles to the shaft. Uh, that is the course design. And this is much easier and ergonomic for me to move my, my fingers very well, right? So uh, the dominant hand being the left hand, my portal is the left. 
So therefore, uh, as you would run to one, I just go a little further. You're doing a continuous closure. I believe in a multi-layer uh, closure and, and a continuous closure. I do not use fancy uh, uh, barb sutures or, uh, uh, or any of the other sutures that are uh, supposed to have these barbs or quills uh, because I've been used to suturing since 1985. So it's like 30 years of suturing and now you try to tell me to move over to a, a barb suture. It really doesn't, I require my assistant to hold because when the assistant holds uh, the, the suture for me, he gives me direction. And he can, and it's not that he moves out of the theater when I'm suturing with a barb suture that he goes and has a cigarette and comes back. He's there in the theater. He's, giving, he's guiding me with, with uh, giving me direction of the uh, placement of the suture by holding, as you can see. So I, my first layer is, is done. And then uh, you have approximated all the uh, tissues together at the bottom to avoid a dead space formation because that's the best way you will avoid any hematomas from collecting and the scar from weakening. So the, the reason that you need to uh, approximate the tissue, they're not really locking, they're just a running suture and it need not be airtight. It's just bringing the tissues in opposition. That is the rule of the, uh, of the game. So uh, once the tissues have been brought down and uh, opposed and you've finished your first layer, you will then go on to the second layer. Now, as you uh, become more and more experienced, you can probably use a longer length of suture and continue from back to front as I'm doing here. And then I will be able to bring the sub area of the myometrium with the sub layer on the other side. So my tissues have been now brought in together in my second layer. If my fibroid bed is very deep, I will take a third layer just as you would do it at a, a, at a laparotomy. So you do a multi-layer closure always, whether it's a laparoscopy or a laparotomy, so that the tissues are brought into opposition. And once I go on to the, to the end uh, point, I will then be able to suture back, uh, rather the notch back at my first knotted end. And then I complete my closure of the second bed. So I have achieved a good approximation of the tissues. I've achieved good hemostasis. The effect of vasopressin always wears off uh, during the procedure. So you don't have to worry as long as there are no spurters because vasopressin is not, not going to stop the bleeding from a spurter. It's only going to stop your oozing for a while. So my second layer has been done with and then I retrieve the needles and then I uh, be, uh, do, uh, do the third layer which is a base wall uh, continuous suture. So I can use a uh, Vicryl, I can use Polysop. Polysop is preferred over micro again, these companies are different, but the, the braiding is much less on the, uh, with the polysop so that the passage of the suture is, uh, is good and swift. I can alternatively even use uh, the um, uh, monocryl, uh, that, uh, which is colored, and that uh, gives me a good, uh, uh, good, good passage. It's very swift to move with the monocryl, and uh, that's for the last layer. Now, basically, when you're doing the baseball suture, what you're doing is you're trying to bury your sin. Basically, you do not want to see the raw area of the, of the uh, myometrium and the incision. So therefore, all the sutures are buried, including the knot. So therefore, um, I, uh, as you can see, I go from inside out, outside in, and now I take. And this is deliberately done uh, without any speeding up of the, of the cassette uh, of the video, just to show that that's the way I'm going to pull on. And I can see that I can now place even my knot very adequately as I begin my passage of the, of the suture. I'll now uh, just move a little faster to show that as I go in, I go from outside, inside out, and then I continue all the way across from one end to the other so that my final rip result is that I can barely see my, my sutures. I do not see the raw area. So therefore, I don't have to worry about even trying to hunt for a adhesion barrier as long as I've stuck to the tenets of good surgery, try to see that there's a minimal bleeding or the, uh, you remove the blood clots, you do a good lavage, and then you can see that except for the last suture, that uh, last knot uh, that would be seen, nothing else is visible, right? So at the end of the day, good surgical skills by uh, being ambidextrous, so you can use both your hands, and that uh, you remove all the blood clots, you remove the esha, you do a good lavage. Professor Sam always said, use even up to 10 liters of uh, saline for a lavage, and you use a warm ringer like it or a warm uh, saline 
uh, 34 degrees, uh, 35 degrees to uh, bring about uh, 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 heating and that will then prevent even adhesion formation because there's no cold area inside. You need to retrieve every needle under vision as you come out after every suturing. That's, you can see how clean that incision looks after it has been sutured. Right, so in summary, what you need to do is that the depth of the Myanmar bed determines the number of layers of closure. You use standard sutures, you use needles that are 36 or 40 degrees curve. In the earlier days, in the 80s, we used straight needles. They're not, they're not available anymore ever since Harry Ridge described the, uh, the technique of curved suture, uh, using curved needles to any size incision. And it's hemostatic, it's less thermal damage. Right, so the incision being transferred, it parallels the arcuate arteries, resulting in less bleeding. This is a study from Japan that showed that the transfer incision is useful as it reduces the amount of bleeding in laparoscopic myomectomy. It also shortens the operation time where the fibroids are large. Right, so uh, what next? How do we deliver the fibroids? Right, everyone likes to show how long steps that, that they can yeah, use their morselator. And um, uh, we uh, come to the uh, morselator that was first used manually by Kurt Sem. Then a Mexican doctor in his, uh, in the honor of Professor Sem developed a serrated edge morselator, once again named as SEMM. And then later on, Kurt Sem being the engineer that he was, developed the, uh, the, for the first electric uh, or the electronic morselator. Now that's the rotocup that's being used. Uh, you can see that I'm using it without a bag and we come to that later, why the bag should not be used. Uh, and uh, basically, you need to be under vision. You need to go on enucleating this. You all have seen this. I'm just going to fast forward. But what's important is that you have to have a good assistant who gives you direction, right? So therefore, he's going to give you direction, point the fibroid towards the uterus. And you don't go on swirling that fibroid around. Be very slow. Reduce your speed if time is required. Again, this is time consuming. I do not like to use marcellators now, not because the FDA, I'm not worried about the FDA because the FDA is in the United States and you know how the United States and the Trump uh, policies are and so are the policies of the FDA. We follow our own rules out here. And secondly, if you are very secure, uh, you should not really be worried about uh, this uh, big stories about the bags, etc. Industries like to sell big bags and make money out of it. But if you are very careful and you see that you do not cause any, uh, any of the tissues to fly around, you don't have to worry about parasitic fibers coming in, but you have to be meticulous. You need to irrigate very well. You need to keep the uh, position of the head a little high. You need to keep the fibroid and your, and your, distance, and your uh, direction of morselation towards the bladder. Don't go towards the liver. Right, and as you go transversely, and this is the correct uh, site of going from the left portal if you use a marcellator, right? And I'll give you my reasons why I don't like to use marcellators by and large. Uh, there are much better methods of, of uh, getting the, the, uh, the fibroids out. So we can also, if you don't have a marcellator, and this is what happened in one of the uh, training uh, programs, I was traveling outside of Bombay, they did not have a marcellator. And of course, I could not take it out vaginally because the patient um, had a very tight vagina. So he, I used my normal surgical knife, made my incision. I had a good assistant who was watching, and that's my poor man's tool. He was watching very well, focused on the, on the monitor. And I went on uh, making, of course, I required to then massage my hand at the end of the day because you can make small bits and retrieve it to an extended portal, right? So this is before... Uh, the, the, uh, the people from Changung described their method of uh, marcellation. And this is from the AGL, just to show you what happens if you try to go vertically, right? You don't know what's beyond. So what lies beneath is very important. And if you're not careful, this is what is going to happen as what happened to this surgeon. He went on marcellating. He thought, well, there's nothing around, marcellated, and oops, he went into the, into the uh, large, into the sigmoid. And then he made a hole in the sigmoid. So these are catastrophic uh, problems that can occur. You don't want that to happen. Therefore, as I said, it's always transversely uh, uh, directed for the removal of the fibroids uh, with the morselator. Otherwise, you use the, the, the you do a colpotomy. There's a, this is the CCL ball, a vaginal extracting device uh, from uh, from the uh, from Stoltz company that was developed by the doctors from Lausanne. 
and yeah, and I'll, I would uh, make a monopolar incision across this. I will then pass a 10 millimeter claw uh, as, you, as it will come now emerging through this uh, through the trocar. So a vaginal, the vaginal surgeon then puts in the, the claw forceps, right? And with this, he grasps the fibroid and fibroids up to eight or 10 centimeters, depending upon how, how parents the vagina is, uh, you can remove this and then you can even morselate it uh, either manually or, or even uh, some people have used, even use a morselator in the vaginal part or, or, and to, so that there's nothing going in vagina, uh, into, the, in, into the pelvis so that there's no danger of any uh, problems to the, uh, to the structures within the pelvis. They can go on removing multiple fibroids as we removed in this case, you can go on taking it out. And then of course, at the end of the procedure, you either vaginally or laparoscopically close the vagina, go, do a good lavage, get rid of all the blood, blood clots and uh, debris, and also to see that there is no tissue that is left, uh, fragmented uh, tissue that could result in a parasitic fibroid. Uh, so that's the way one would remove. At the end of it, as I said, that we do not use robots. We don't use any barbs or quill sutures. It's only good surgical skills and dexterity that makes things very comfortable. In, in summary, medicalist and suturing very important. The last layer could be closed with a 1-0 or a 2-0. You minimally use the thermal energy, bipolar mode, just to coagulate. You avoid dead space formation, and therefore, you get rid of the fears. People have been worried about the integrity of the scar. In early 2010, uh, Parker, Bill Parker reported 18 case reports of spontaneous rupture during pregnancy and he even evaluated why these had occurred and that was mainly because of inadequate closure, improper closure of the Myanmar bed. There have been concerns about uh, the uh, adhesion formation, but the study that was uh, described by uh, Takeda and others in 2008 showed that uterine rupture during pregnancy after a good laparoscopic myomectomy is rare Vaginal birth after laparoscopic myomectomy appears to be safe in selected patients who meet the criteria, right? And again, as I said, Bill Parker said, it seemed reasonable for surgeons to adhere to techniques that were developed for abdominal myomectomy, namely limiting the use of electrosurgery and a multi-layer closure of the myometrium. So a multi-layer closure is favored over a single layer closure. Again, Pistophides uh, reported seven uterine rupture cases after laparoscopic myomectomy and updating the literature. And he said that if it's adequately uh, performed by adequately trained and experienced surgeons who know and have good skills at suturing and avoid too much use of diathermy and you use a multi-layer closure for intramural as well as sub myoma with deep intrusion, uh, you would be very safe and there would be no rupture of the uterus. So it has always been controversial in the last millennium but it's an effective alternative to a laparotomic myomectomy, even though it is technically demanding for the skilled endoscopist, right? We got to be like that cat who can go across uh, these very uh, fierce dogs that are there and you walk with your head held high. So your, your critics are not going to be there to jump at you and catch you by your neck. I, I like to say I am, I have been trained in robotic surgery, but I can do much more than what the robot can do. And the robot cannot do which is what I do and which I should be doing, right? And what's important, therefore, is to practice, practice, and practice to be a good surgeon. As I said, I had one of these doctors from South Africa sitting behind her, and I appreciated the way beautifully the braids had been done, how meticulous the knots had been placed, rather the braids, braids had been placed. If we practice this on our on our pelvic trainers, uh, we don't uh, end up to be like this instant pizza that you see at Frankfurt Airport that you put a euro in and you can get the pizza out. So, ladies and gentlemen, one can achieve skills at laparoscopic myomectomy. And if you're good enough with both your hands, God has given you two hands, you can achieve the impossible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prashant. Thank you to a great teacher, a guru in laparoscopic uh, myomectomy. Thank you for that uh, piece of advice. Uh, Professor Prashan is the uh, present elect of APH and uh, we'll leave question and answers to the last. And I already know there are a few questions lined up for you, but let's go over to uh, the next speaker. The next speaker is, uh, Professor Dong Choi, Professor Choi, 
Can we get his, uh, get him on the screen? I can't see him now. Can, how do I get him on the screen? Yes, to share uh, the screen. Please share the screen. Uh, whoever is uh, organizing uh -huh. this. Uh, Are you seeing him on the screen? Is everybody seeing Dr. Choi on the screen? We are seeing everybody on the screen. Hello. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Well, Dr. Choi, uh, he's the suave looking one. If you are looking at him from all the pictures on the screen, he's right in the center looking at me now. To, uh, he looks like one of those Korean hungs and uh, film stars from Korea. He's the chief director and founder of Choi San Women's Clinic Korea. And he's a visiting professor to the Samsung Medical Center of the Sung Kyo Kwan University College of Medicine. And Dr. Choi specializes in high food treatment of uterine diseases. In fact, uh, before I decided on the high food machine, I visited him and five other experts from Korea. So uh, let's go over to Dr. Choi and his talk is titled Symptom Score Change and Volume Reduction of Uterine Fibra with HIFU. Over to you, Dr. Choi. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, I will, uh, thank you for introducing me. Um, I will today talk about uh, symptom score change and volume reduction of uterine fibroids with HIFU. Uh, well, I uh, graduated Yonsei University Medical School and I did my inter internship residency at Gangnam Severance Hospital and clinical fellowship in Aju University. And now I'm an outside professor of Samsung Medical Center and I am a founder of Choi Sun Women's Clinic. And actually I did uh, 2,125 cases of Haifu since uh, 2015. It's my uh, fifth year now uh, uh, doing this practice. Actually I did one today, so it's 26. And Dr. Lee came to our clinic uh, with uh, Dr. Zhang uh, at 2018. And we had many discussions about the high food treatment. It was a very good discussion. And Dr. Selva from Malaysia came to our clinic last year. And we also talked and he observated a procedure with me. Uh, coming back to our topic, uh, the indications of high food in the field of gynecology is mostly uterine fibroids and adenomyosis. And there's some reports of endometriosis of the abdominal wall, and also retained placenta and tubal or uh, coronal pregnancy. And today I will talk to you about the most uh, uh, treated uh, disease, which is uterine fibroids. As you can see, uh, this is a patient with a total hysterectomy. You can see a well demarcated uh, mass here is a uterine fibroid about five centimeters here. And uh, you can see an ill defined uh, enlarged ut uterus here. Uh, we, all, uh, we call this usually adenomyosis. When we take the MRI image, you can see we, you can compare a normal uterus with the uterine fibroid here. Uh, in a normal uterus, you can see the endometrium the junctional zone and the myometrium. But uh, when you see a uterine fibroid, you can see a well demarcated lesion like this. And uh, the adenomyosis case, you can see uh, hemorrhagic spots inside the endometrium and the widening of the junctional zone. Well, the symptoms of the uterine fibroids, we have um, mostly three major symptoms, many kinds of pains, many kinds of bleeding, and many kinds of mass effects. So the pain is this menorrhea, pelvic pain, back pain, so on. And bleeding can be menorrhagia, spotting, and the mass effects can be frequency by crushing uh, the bladder or 
constipation by pressing the bowel. And we can have another, uh, it's not a symptom, but a phenomenon that causes subfertility because of implantation disorder or uterine peristalsis disorders. As, all, uh, as uh, everybody knows, the uterine fiber treatment options is operative and radiofrequency ablation and uterine artery embolization and haiku, and there is some kinds of medical therapies. The principle of haiku is, uh, as this boy is doing, it is similar to making fire with a magnifying glass. Uh, haiku is a focusing energy to a point, so the tumor is coagulated and necrotized. Uh, there's a, a transducer that forms the uh, ultrasonic energy and we gather to a point and point the focal point to the tumor like this. Actually, the focal point is very small. The width is uh, 1.1 millimeter and the depth is usually 3.3 milliliters. So we can make a very accurate ablation by this small focal point. Uh, we usually classify the haiku systems by its guidance. Uh, there's an MR guided haiku and there's a US guided haiku. Uh, the en energy source is all the same at, for uh, these two kinds of haikus. Uh, theoretically, uh, the focal point makes the uh, ablation point and the points gather to make a line and the line makes a slice and slice makes a volume. But actually, a point is made and then uh, the gathered energy suddenly explodes to make a volume of necrosis. So we can see it by the sonographic findings as this hyperechoic lesions. Uh, approvals of Haifu for uterine fibroids started at 2013 in Korea. The Korean FDA approved US guided haifu for uterine fibroids and adenomyosis. And on 2015, the US FDA approved MR guided haifu for women who wanted to maintain fertility. And on 2016, the KSOG, the Korean Society of OBGYN, uh, made a haifu treatment guideline. So many uh, uh, physicians use this guideline to treat uh, myomas for the haifu. And on 2018, the KSUOG, the Korean Society of Ultrasound in OBGYN, uh, published a textbook that deals haiku for the first time. And uh, as, every, as you know, 2019, the UK made a nice guidance for the US guided haiku for uterine fibroids. Uh, this is uh, the textbook that was published by the KSUOG on 2018. And the chapter 15 is US guided, uh, US used in interventional procedures. And the haiku chapter is in this. Uh, actually, I wrote this, uh, this part in this chapter. Uh, there's a principle here and there's uh, the method of the treatments. And there's many kind of cases, I deal about the cases and the complications and so on. And the US FDA on October 2015 uh, broadened the use of MR guided haifu to women preserving fertility. And 2019 UK NICE guidance was, uh, was, launched, uh, was uh, launched, published. The goal of HIFU is, in my opinion, uh, there's two goals. The first is high volume reduction, and the second is high symptom relief. Uh, th these two actually goes together. So if the volume reduction is high, uh, you, we usually uh, 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 get more high symptom relief. To achieve this goal, the NPV ratio more, has to be more than 80%. I will tell you about the MPV later. So if the MPV ratio is over 80%, we get superior volume reduction. We usually uh, can get 40 to 60% volume reduction in six months. 
And if the MPV ratio is over 80%, we can have superior clinical symptom improvement, usually 50 to 70% in six months. The MPV is non-perfusion volume and equally means the necrotized volume. Uh, by MPV, we can evaluate the treated volume, and second, we can predict the therapeutic outcome. To check the uh, MPV, we can use the ultrasound or the MRI. So we call it, uh, when we use the ultrasound, we call it contrast-enhanced ultrasound. Uh, we can calculate the perfused uh, volume, and then we can ca calculate the non-perfusion volume. To see, uh, see how much uh, was treated and ablated. This is the MRI finding. This is the contrast enhanced MRI. We can also see the myoma that is enhanced here before the HIFU. And just after HIFU, we can see the necrotized area uh, not enhanced like this. So uh, compared to US, uh, CEUS, MR. Uh, uh, MRI is the best way to check MPV. Uh, CEUS may be convenient, but incorrect in ev evaluating the MPV, especially in large uterine fibroids or multiple uterine fibroids. And pre and post MR, uh, contrast enhanced MRI is recommended to check the immediate treatment results. And post three months to six months uh, MRI is recommended to check the final results, which is volume reduction rate and residual volume. Uh, this is a, a image that uh, appears in more than 80%. I think it's more than uh, uh, nearly, nearly 100% of necrotized region here. A very good result. You can also see a large myoma here. It was nearly all totally ablated you can see a little bit of viable tissue on the margin like this. So if it, the MPV is more than 80%, we can think that the result, the therapeutic outcome will be very good. So to evaluate the symptom change, uh, we use the UFS QOL, which is the uterine fibrosis symptom and health related quality of life questionnaire. Uh, this survey uh, that was made in 2002 by ACOG to objectify subjective symptoms of uterine fibroids and to evaluate the efficacy of treatment. This questionnaire is composed of eight questionnaires to check the symptom severity score and 29 questionnaires to check the health re related quality of life. This is the symptom severity score questionnaires. There are eight uh, questionnaires and about uh, five is uh, related to the bleeding, uh, four is related to the bleeding, and one is uh, related to the pain or tightness or pressure, and two are related to the frequency urinary pattern, and one is uh, feeling fatigue, and we uh, check and make a score of this. And this is the health-related quality of life, we have uh, 29 questionnaires here. I usually use uh, this one to predict the uh, results, symptom score change of, uh, previously and after the uh, treatment. And we can calculate uh, the score by this uh, formula like this. It's just an easy uh, math. Uh, it's not difficult. I usually use the symptom score severity rate above one. So high MPV is the most important thing, I think. So if the MPV is over 80%, uh, we can predict a better symptom improvement. This, uh, this uh, picture shows you that uh, if the MPV is more than 80%, the clinical successive rate is higher. So for a high therapeutic outcome, MPV should be as much as possible, and we can predict more volume reduction and more symptom relief and lesser re-intervention -inter rates. Uh, this patient had a sub, sub myoma here, 
uh, so, uh, and after the treatment, after seven months, it appeared like this tiny one here. The volume reduction rate was over uh, 97% and the symptom relief uh, rate was about 80%. You can see the submucosal myoma here. Uh, the volume reduction was almost 50% and uh, the, the uh, symptom uh, uh, relief rate was about 70%. Yeah. You can see uh, much of the necrotized area, but you can see some of the viable tissue here. So we have to follow up and see if it's growing or something. This patient has multiple myomas. Uh, we ablated each one like this. And then seven months later, the volume reduction was about 41%. The symptom relief was about 71%. You can see this multiple huge myoma here. It is uh, it exceeded the pelvic cavity. So we did the high food treatment. Four months later, uh, the each myoma shrinked and the uterus went back inside the pelvic cavity. And seven months later, it, it got smaller. So the volume reduction rate was about 70 percent and the symptom relief rate was about 50 percent. So the conclusion to achieve the goal which is volume reduction and symptom relief and PV is the uh, is very is the most important thing so we have to ablate uh, as much as we can at least 80 percent is suggested and if we do this we can uh, we can get about uh, about forty to sixty percent of volume reduction in six months, and about fifty to seventy percent of, of clinical symptom improvement in six months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Choi. Uh, really enjoy your talk. Uh, now is question and answers time. You can either uh, write your questions down in the chat room, or if you are visible or uh, the volumes activated, you can of course ask via your microphone. Uh, okay. I have here one or two questions uh, already okay. from the chat room. Uh, first question, is uh, to Professor Professor Prashan. Prashan, hey. stand by. You have a lot of questions for you. But uh, one of the questions, and and everybody remembers your condom theory uh, in regards to mosellation on the fibroid and begging the uh, the fibroids before mosellation. They remembered what you say about the condom. Can you please repeat that to everybody? Well, uh, if, if one is contemplating doing a laparoscopic myomectomy and then trying to bag and morselate it, you're actually parking that fibroid on the bowel before you can put it in the bag. So with the result that the time that is spent, you already upstage the disease. The movement of the harmonic scalpel on the tissue, or even if you're doing electrosurgery, causes micro tissue to fly around as you would see uh, when you are using the harmonic on the fibroid. So even the act of enucleation is kind of spreading the, the disease if it's a leomyosarcoma. So this is akin to using a condom after the act of sex. The pregnancy cannot be prevented. That was my take. It's not actually my take. It's my son's take and I copy his sentence. So let's give the credit to Abhishek. The son teaches the father. On how to use a condom. <laughs> yes, but yes, yes, yes. Uh, Prashant, you are the present elect, and I'm glad you voiced your opinion because that's very important to a lot of us uh, in Asia doing myomectomy, uh, not using the back, uh, because uh, many of us believe the, the risk of uh, sarcoma is very low. And uh, 
very low, it's very low because I, I fail to understand how the FDA got a one in 350 uh, uh, incidents of uh, leomyosarcoma in their series. And I'm sure with all the people who are sitting out there across the world, listening to uh, this talk or participating in the talk, I'm sure we do not have that kind of an incidence. And if you look at literature, it goes to almost one in 10,000. And the largest series that was described by, uh, by Bernd Boyar from the Charity Hospital in Berlin, he had 34,000 plus uh, hysterectomies that were done in their center. And they only had four patients of leomyosarcoma. Now, the thing is that if a patient has leomyosarcoma, whether you do a laparotomy or a laparoscopy, you have already upstaged her during the time that you are enucleating the fibroid. If you were to remove the entire uterus in total, possibly the spillage would be less. And there has been a study that was published in the JMIC journal that showed that if you aspirate the peritoneal fluid, even before taking the incision on a suspected leomyosarcoma, you would get the cancer cells lying around in that fluid. So therefore, uh, the, this theory of... Uh, uh, of um, the um, uh, uh, morselation uh, causing uh, upstaging of the disease uh, <clears throat> in the way that the, w, that the FDA talks about is a little too far-fetched. Of course, I'm not going to say that, yet. well, if it's a leomyosarcoma, go ahead and, and morselate. You do not morselate if it's a leomyosarcoma. A rapidly increasing size in the fibroid is uh -huh. one that... Oh, yeah, my topic is for example. Yes, please continue. Have you finished? A, a, a markedly uh, vascular fibroid uh, or uh, your LDH levels are high, or any of the parameters that would be there to suggest a leomyosarcoma, do not do a laparoscopic surgery. Go and do a, 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 an open surgery on her. But then you know that it's a calculated risk even when you do a, a, a surgery on her by open technique of, of, of a laparotomy that you're probably going to upstage if you're just going to do a mimectomy. So these are things that one has to, uh, to, to keep in mind. What is very important also is that you need to do a good lavage. You need to uh, keep the head end of the patient up and then allow all the fluid to drain. You irrigate profusely. You may even spend 10 liters of, of normal saline or ringer lactate uh, doing the flooding of the pelvis. And then you will see that there may be small tissue bits that naturally come out from, from the hiding and you need to retrieve them very well. So therefore, um, uh, uh, that's the take on morselation. I do not like to use the morselator, not because of FDA. My problem is my incisions are always five millimeters. And if I try to use a morselator and I go up to 12 or 15 or, or 20 millimeters as some people have, it's a very painful incision in the left lateral quadrant. On the other hand, if you follow the philosophy of Chi Long Li and Wang, who described the Changung method of getting it through the umbilicus using uh, using um, the, the the retractor uh, from applied medical that is the wound retractor. Uh, uh, you use an extra small size. You can make a two centimeter incision, expand to four centimeters, and you can now remove the fibroid by by chopping it through this incision uh, very well. I can show a video of that if one wanted to, but. Uh, that's the, the, the technique that has been developed in Changung, and then you reconstruct that umbilicus back to normal. Uh, it looks absolutely normal. So there is that is much better than using a morselator. Okay, thank you, thank you, Prashant. There you have it. Yeah. The uh, present lack of APH has spoken. That is a great relief to many of us, and the majority of us still uh, find it troublesome, cumbersome, and in fact, really. Uh, does not really uh, mitigate the spread, does not really mitigate the spread of the sarcoma because the moment the knife is down, it really spread the sarcoma. Let me just read to you, someone just sent to, to me on the recommendations during uterine morselation. And I've read a lot, this is perhaps the best, uh, given by Society of Gynae Oncology in December 2013 from USA. And this is one statement which I would like to share. That, that no reliable method is currently available to differentiate benign from malignant leomyosarcomas or stroma sarcomas before they are removed. 
Furthermore, these diseases offer an extremely poor prognosis even when specimens are removed intact. So there you have it. Uh, what the oncologist says is that even if you remove it intact, uh, you would have probably uh, spread the disease the moment the knife is down onto the serosa layer. And, and, and I think this is uh, very rational, very reasonable. Uh, thank you, Prashant. Now, the next thank you. question. The Hello, next Prashant, can you hear me? This is Dr. Kevin. Yeah, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi, I, I, have, I have my own views on this. First of all, uh, Leo sar myosarcoma is not something that cannot be diagnosed. Little high index of suspicion at time of surgery. Almost all cases, you can have a very high index of suspicion. Now, what I do in my practice is, uh, if I have a feeling that this could be a Leo myosarcoma without doing any mausolation before, in fact, even before I do the enucleation, I first take a biopsy of the fibroid and send it for frozen section. By the time my myomectomy is complete, I have a report from the lab, whether it is a leomyosarcoma, just a leomyoma, or leomyoma with increased mit mitosis. All the diagnosis is in front of me, and I make an informed decision whether to uh, con counsel the patient relative to go ahead and do a hysterectomy with a leomyosarcoma, or increase mitotic, I definitely put it in a bag. In fact, in my practice, any fibroid more than 4.55 centimeters, I always put an endo bag. And I don't agree with you about the condom after use because what you're forgetting is when you're doing a myomectomy, you're cutting into the uterus and upstaging. I fully agree. But when you're mosturating Prashant, you're using a revolution speed of 33,000 per second. Now that's like you making a milkshake in your liquefier and not putting the cap on. You can imagine what yeah, is going to happen to your kitchen. No, no, whether, so, whether you use a, whether you use a morsel or a knife, you're cutting into malignant tissue, right? And if you have, you have your point of saying that you're going to send it for histopathology and then it turns out to be a leomyosarcoma, you have already gone ahead and done your myomectomy, uh, 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 enucleating the fiber and caused further spillage. You're already upstage at that time itself, and your parking of that fibroid on the bowel has also upstaged. It's not that you're, you're parking it in a bag. Before no, you no, I fully agree. Bag in, I fully agree. I fully yeah, agree what that, you're saying. I understood what you're saying. But my, that, my point that, is the difference between just parking yeah, but I'm, but and, and you know, doing a mausolation like you showed in your video without a bag. I don't think that's uh, advisable at all. Because, you know, it's like talking, going for a walk in the rain by parking it there and then going for a walk in a, in a cyclone. When you're just yeah, mosculating yeah. and letting, you know, the, the fibroid uh, mince at and such a high revolution let's, speed. Let, let, let's have a, uh, let's have how many leomyosarcomas have the entire group who's listening and contributing to the discussion today. I've had leomyosarcoma out of all the patients, right? That's so right. It's, it's just that for, for that one patient, one should have had a high index of suspicion at the beginning clinically itself. But the woman's Correct. I agree with you. I agree with you about that. And then if it's a real sarcoma that you you say that you're taking a biopsy at one end, you're not taking multiple biopsies. And therefore, uh, if uh, it's missed at the other end of the fibroid, you still have uh, missed the boat. No, no. Anyway. My sarcoma is not a segmental disease. If it's there, it's throughout the fibroid. I'm sorry. Okay, you there can, are lots, and, lots of questions coming. I think uh, Dr. Manjula has something to say. My Panelists. Thanks, Prashant. Dr. Manjula. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Dr. Kevin. But the point, the proponents of the contained mausolation, most of the time it is not about upgrading of the sarcoma because we all know, like sir said, it is going to be upgraded. But basically because of the splaying of the tissues which can actually spread it into the multiple corner. But listening to the tips and tricks of Dr. Prashant, when he said you have to decrease the RPMs which, which you are doing and see that you don't pull it, pull the tissue into it against the resistance. I think that tip goes a long way in against the splaying of the tissue. So, but the proponents of the uh, in bag or even the contained morselation is against the splaying rather than the up upgrade. And it makes it easier at the end to take out very small, small bits from everywhere to be taken and not to be left over so that we do not end up with parasitic leomyomas. Thank you, sir. Prashant, sir, it was a great talk. And even thank Dr. Choi. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just add, uh, we have to move on. 
uh, uh, a few a few ideas came out. Number one is uh, must remember not every operating theater in the world has a frozen section facility to do that. You are very privileged to have that facility. Second, I you think about it when you when you approach a myoma or fibroids, why do you want to do laparoscopy? Isn't that you believe in all goodness to be fair to a patient that you believe? 99.9% or 100% that is benign. Because if, or, if you have a thought that it is going to be a 0.001% chance that it is not going to be benign or it is a sarcoma, then you should not be doing laparoscopy. You should not even right. think of using the bag. Right? I mean, if you right. want to do a bag, means you're not confident of your diagnosis of it being benign. Okay, but that is food for thought. Uh, okay, another question. Uh, uh, can I move over to uh, my elegant lady co-panelist, uh, Dr. Manjula? Dr. Manjula, I know you're about one of those rare, uh, talented gynecologists who has done uh, MRI HIFU. Can you tell us your experience? Because many of us have no experience in this. Please tell us your experience. Uh, and at the same time, at the same time, I know you're very well read. Can you please summarize or explain the salient points of the nice guideline? Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Dr. Lee. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. See, MR Haifu, when it just came to India, we started using it and promoting it. But we had our own fallacies, negative points, and the positive points. Yes, like you said, and like, like Dr. Choi said, every patient wants a minimally invasive or non-invasive or scarless surgery if given an option. But saying that, every hospital, especially the multi-speciality uh, hospitals, have an MRI machine which is fixed for so many other things. So we had to wait for a time slot, which can be a uh, different timing as that of the regular days or in the evening five, after five or a Sunday. Second, we are at the whim and fancy of the radiologist who, who has to take care of the mare. And then the other things which, are, which were coming in our way was or not all the patients were fit for MR uh, guided thing. So taking it out, even the costs were almost similar to that of the open or laparoscopic surgery. So being a surgeon ourselves, like minimally invasive surgery, we have always had a thing that it is easy Oh, I lost you. Uh, Manjula, we lost you. Can somebody, can, can the organizer do something about this? We lost Dr. Manjula. No, we can't get we can't get Dr. Manjula. Dr. Manjula, I'm so sorry we lost you. No. Hello? Uh, Manjula, you're back, you're back. Can you I'm so sorry we lost you. Can you just repeat. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry for the connection issue. Yeah. Uh, now, 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 now yeah. it's okay. Yeah, we did have cases where patient was immediately very happy. The satisfaction rate was good as far as the bleeding is concerned. Satisfaction rate was good as far as the pain was concerned. But the size, when they start, the psychologically, the patient was not happy much because after three months, they do a scan. After six months, they do a scan. The fibroid is still there, but otherwise they were okay with it. And some of the patients we had to, uh, because of the extrusion of it into the intracavitary, as an intracavitary lesion, and then coming out through the vagina, they would come back to us with the bleeding and with the uh, necrotic tissue coming out through the vagina. So that was something which was not very, we were not very happy to deal with. And slowly being a minimal invasive surgeon we strip over directly to the um, laparoscopic surgeries and all that what about nice guidelines my dear uh, yeah nice, nice guidelines. guidelines like we all know dr david is somebody who has been very pioneer into doing it so it is very clear that nice guidelines says the patient should be more than 20, 45 years and we should be looking at at least if they're multi in multiple 
fibroids, you look at five fibroids at a time. And each fibroid at a time is what we are looking at. And the cutoff centimeters should be 10 to 12 centimeter, nothing more than this. So patient who is symptomatic and not having the pressure symptoms and the more than 45 years, and then five fibroids is something which we can look at. And some of the guidelines, like ACOG say, we can go up to eight fibroids also, but each one should be tackled and again, okay, uh, let's move on then. Uh, somehow we lost Dr. Manjula. Uh, there are a lot of questions on uh, pertaining to sarcomas and uh, MRI diagnosis of uh, your back. No, I was just saying there are a lot of questions on sarcoma, MRI diagnosis. How do we know whether it's benign or malignant? Well, let's leave it to we the do next. Not know. Sorry. I want to make a point here, Dr. Lee. We do not know, but when it is used, when it is used for malignancy treatment, we take it for granted that it is used for this. That's it. No tissue diagnosis. Sure. That's fine. Because like many of us, when we ask our patients, uh, first time you find a fibroid, let's say it's about three centimeters asymptomatic, we ever ask ourselves, is this going to be sarcoma? And the answer is no. And you're willing to watch then why are we uh, uh, asking every high food practitioner uh, and tell them you're doing a uh, high food and then you no know, uh, histology? What if there's a risk of sarcoma? It's the same thing I ask you now that if you have a 3CM fibroid, 4CM fibroid, minimal symptoms, and you ask your patient to, aren't you just as guilty as not having a diagnosis? Okay, anyway. On to the question of sarcoma, MRI, and how to, how to diagnose sarcomas. Can I leave it to episode two, whereby my professor Chang Lian will be giving his talk on Haifu? Uh, because uh, there, there will be a, a specialist or expert in Haifu for every episode, and you probably get all the answers you want to ask. <laughs> That been uh, a, a, really given birth. Birth. You can hear a baby in the background. And, and that's the question of what are the pregnancy rates and outcomes after high food. Again, there will be an expert that will explain pregnancy rates and outcomes after high food. Uh, go back to back to uh, uh, Dr. Choi. Uh, someone asked, how many myomas uh, can you normally treat? Or do you have any criteria in your private practice? Do you turn away patients or do you have a set guideline to what you accept as uh, a treatable uh, HIFU, uh, myoma for HIFU, Dr. Choi? Uh, well, the num I don't think the number is important. Uh, over, I, I have experience of treating more than 10 mm. or over 10, I think, but uh, Usually, the guideline made by K uh, Korean Society of OBGYN made a high food guideline. At that guideline, we usually treat um, myomas under 12 centimeters by high food. I don't know the exact um, reason why it's 12 centimeters, but I think uh, if the myomas get over 10 centimeters, uh, well, the reduction. Uh, volume is quite lesser and so i think uh, they are worried about uh, more uh, less symptom relief or something but uh, if in my, my policy is if the myoma is larger than 10 centimeters i usually use GN, gnrh agonist to shrink uh, it under 10, 10 centimeters and then do the high food thank you okay uh there are one or two sensitive questions for you, but you know, I think it's important. Uh, you are a laparoscopic surgeon. Now, what makes you uh, take up HIFU for treatment of uh, fibroids? It's a general question which a lot of people ask. Why do you switch? Because in laparoscopy, probably uh, you know you're, you're very well versed, like the many of us. But why? Why do you change to HIFU? And the next question is, there are so many high food machines in the world. Why do you choose that machine 
from China because you in Korea the 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 uh, technology is very good, very high, and especially you have offers from USA, you have offers from Europe. Why China? Dr. Choi. Okay, wait. Sorry, sorry. Question one more time, please. Okay, sure. I repeat that. Sorry, it's too fast. Mm. Uh, the first simple question is, why do you choose? Hi, uh, Hi, Uh You know, when you can do laparoscopy, why? Well, um, my first reason was I I wanted to do a more fancy treatment. Yeah, uh, that uh, to make a less um, less scar or something. Actually, when, when I was uh, being trained in the Samsung Medical Center, a Haiku machine was adopted at the Department of Radiology. Uh, at that time, I just uh, got the idea of the Haiku machine. And after I graduated, I did, I did my diploma. I went out to the field and I, I, I remember that, um, that concept, that treatment. And at that time, the, at around uh, 2010, uh, the Korean uh, gynecologist uh, uh, had a, a movement of doing the haiku treatment in the, uh, the field of gynecology. So at that time, I was very interested. I remembered the first context of haiku when I was in my residency, and I challenged it to do it. Okay, the next sensitive question. There's so many Haifu machines in the world, including Korea, which has uh, the, the machines, and uh, there are many more machines in China. But why that machine? Well, actually, uh, I, 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 I thought about adopting the MR guide Haifu. But um, as you know, usually the radiologists uh, deal with that machine, and the price is quite more higher. And there are very many patients to adopt the MR Haifu in Korea. And uh, there are uh, quite uh, several kinds of US guided Haifus uh, all, uh, on the market right now. But um, as you know, the Chunqing Haifu has, um, ha has much uh, reports in journals and scientific bases in many cases. Uh, that was the reason I adopted Chunqing Haifu. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I thought it was the, the Chongqing hot pot or, or is, is because of David, David Crankston from Oxford. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Okay, then one or two more questions uh, which I got. Uh, one of them, can I, can I go back to Prashan, your back? Prashan? You're the president elect, so whatever you say is very important to our world. Okay, uh, what do you think of the use of ulipristal acetate for fibroids? Oops, Prashan, you are you have muted yourself, Prashan, or Manjula, you want to say something, Manjula? Yeah, okay, I want to say something. Please, sir, cannot does not want to say. Sir, please go ahead. Well, I don't, I don't um, uh, allude to uh, using ulipristal, especially because in the UK and in uh, in France, I think they had cases of liver uh, liver failure, and therefore the product was supposed to be launched on the twenty second of March in in South Africa, one day before the company called off the release, and it has the, because it's been banned. So I think um, one has to look at it very carefully, whether it's um, uh, A, going to be effective, and two, if it's going to cause these uh, problems with the liver, I would not want to be uh, facing a trial with my patient, then suing me for, for money that I cannot afford to pay her. Okay. Or her family. I, I would like to add something. Yeah, In Dr. India, Manchester. lots of people, especially, yeah. In India, lots of doctors as gynecologists, especially in the districts and all have used these things because the reason being, again, the patient want, always wants medical management. Like sir said, yes, seven cases of liver, uh, um, necessity for liver transplant had been there and uh, in Europe, it is not huge. 
So what is very important if you are using Ulipistil is that you have to do an LFT before and if it is deranged, please do not use it. And LFT has to be done after three months usage of it between the each course. That is very important. So in between and after that, and in my practice, I do not use it just like Sir says, we believe in removing it. But there are times there is saying that I lost you again, Manjula. Manjula, we can't hear you again. And we also can you hear me? Yeah, yeah now. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in, in my practice, I would be using it only in a very select patients where post-operatively there are seedling fibroids where the patient is going to come back and tell that I you still left fibroids inside me. So even though after counseling, that is the only role we do. Otherwise, like Sir said, we hardly use it because being surgeons. But in the districts, it has they have used the negative points of using it is it causes the it, we all know it affects the neoangiogenesis and it affects on the fibroid. So it causes lysis and necrosis. So when we are actually doing the myomectomy, that can actually uh, be very difficult to remove the fibroid after doing the surgery. So uh, we do not use it preoperatively at all. Okay. Uh, Hugo is sitting out there. Maybe Hugo can give his German point of view. But I know that uh, the recommendation from the Royal College is that do not, um, if a patient is already on Ulipristal, uh, check her liver function and continue it after counseling her. But do not start any new case uh, on, on that, uh, on, a, on, a, on a patient. Right. So okay. that's the recommendation. You mentioned Hugo. Hugo is back from his cup of coffee and tea. Hugo, you have to say something. Uh, but before that, before that, Hugo, uh, please crystallize your thoughts. You will have the last say because you are, you are in charge of that working group on uh, high food for, for you. Hello. Before you that, that's one last question. That's one important question. Have patients required to undergo surgery? Morning. Post high food. Huh? Uh, are the surgical nee? plane more you define? Yeah. Are the surgical oh, plane fully defined for patients after high school and if the patient has to undergo myomectomy? Uh, can I pose this question to Dr. Choi? Have you had experience to do a myomectomy after high school? Hmm. Well, uh, actually, I don't do laparoscopic surgery right now in my clinic, but uh, my colleagues who do surgery says that um, after high food, the myomectomy is, there's more adhesion, so the surgery can be a little bit more di uh, difficult. And some, uh, some doctors say that there's a little more bleeding, but, uh, well, I, I usually can't... Um, I'll agree with that because, as you know, ablation makes the uh, coagulation of the vessels. So, Lester, but I agree with that uh, the addition can be more uh, more made uh, with the myometrium and the myoma. So, the surgeon may be a little bit more harder to do the surgery. Okay, um, I have one case so far, and we where I have to go in because uh, this lady has about four fibroids, but one of them didn't uh, resolve so well. I have, to, have to, I have to go in again, but I have no, no problems with the planes. Okay, uh, maybe over to Hugo. Professor Hugo, uh, can you please unmute? Unmute. Can you hear me, Hugo? Hugo, can you hear me? Hugo, over to you. Hugo, can over you to you. I can hear you now. Okay. Hi. Hi. Yeah. I, I followed the discussion all the time, of course. And um, about Uli Pristal, we have, I just had three days ago a discussion with Rudy uh, about Uli Pristal. And it's, uh, well, uh, maybe not in the UK, but here in Europe, it's very difficult. So olipristal treatment uh, for myomas and especially for patients who have bleeding under uh, myomas is offline. 
And um, uh, it's very difficult to do that because if something uh, is going wrong, you're responsible for it. So um, I had a few days ago a, a, a very important patient here who um, had said to me, we want everything with the exception of um, uh, surgery. And I discussed with Rudy and uh, yeah, we said, we cannot use Uripristal. The only thing what we can do is generate channel locks. And as at the moment, HIFU is <laughs> very difficult in, in, in Europe. Um, I proposed her now to have a laparoscopic myomectomy or supracervical um, hysterectomy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Hugo. You're most welcome. Uh, there are one or two questions, but uh, one of them is what type of fibroid you will not do HIFU? Uh, Dr. Choi, can you answer that? What type of fibroid you will not do HIFU? Yeah, pedunculated subserosal myomas are not recommended to do it, uh, uh, to do HIFU. But, um, well, I have several cases of uh, uh, cases that I did pedunculated uh, subserosal myo myomas, but um, there was no problem. They shrink well. I think there is a concern that the my particularly myoma um, detaches from the uterus and rolls around the uh, pelvic cavity. But uh, by my uh, experience, there is no cases of that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There are lots of questions, but some of them, I think uh, in the second episode and the third episode, the experts will answer them. And uh, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Chang Lian and uh, Dr. Raymond as well from South Africa on, on myomas and uh, IFU. Can I now uh, okay, go back to this slide. Before I say goodbye, before I say goodbye, uh, please take note in episode two, the speakers are going to be uh, okay. Professor Leonard Chen, and he's going to talk on uterine fibroids, when to operate and when not to operate. By a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Bei Suan Tiong, past president of ONG Society Singapore. He's going to talk about update on complications of leprosomyomectomy. And of course, the last speaker, the anchor speaker, will be Professor Chang Lian, and his talk is going to be on the experience of HIFU with uterine fibroids. The birthplace huh? ultrasound guided haifu. Uh, and joining me will be co chairperson Professor Suzumi Osamu from Japan. Uh, Professor Suzumi Osamu is the past president of EPAGE. Oh. And my panelists will also be uh, my colleague, oh, yeah. Dr. Lee Kwan Tiong, past president of OJS at Singapore. So we try to get you. The, the best of the lecture series, which I have stuck up from uh, a page or from personal knowledge of all the lectures given. And we look forward to seeing you again to join us. But this time it's going to be on the 23rd of June, Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. China, Singapore time. And before I sign off, I would like to say thank you to all chairpersons, panelists, speakers, and the audience. I'm Dr. Lee from Singapore ONG Group. Thank you very much. And all your questions will be answered in the two or three episodes. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Manjula. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Choi. Thank greetings you. from greetings from Vienna also. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Professor Gill. Professor Gill. Oh, yeah, of course. Professor Gill. <laughs> uh, Prashant, thanks a lot, Prashant. The, uh, and, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.